So let me begin by introducing Gabriel Soma. Um, Gabriel is a secure, cybersecurity researcher at CERT division of Carnegie Mellon's SEI. In his several past lives, he was a Unix admin, acquired a PhD in computer science, became a network architect, and later an IT director. Throughout his career, he has maintained a passion for decentralized computing systems that place control and responsibility in the hands of end users. In his spare time, Gabriel also enjoys con contributing to free and open source software and hardware projects. With that, I'll let uh, Dr. Somo take it over. Thank you, Michael, for that introduction, and thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, I would like to share with you today a alternative to dealing with the supply chain as a proxy for uh, assessing uh, hardware assurance and trustworthiness. And a quick demo of a, of a system that actually is capable of full self-hosting and building its own bitstream all the way down to the FPGA while running on itself. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, uh, let's start with this well-known fact that has been discussed throughout the day today that computers are everywhere and they're not just sitting on your desktop or, or your laptop. They're uh, everyday objects dressed up as, uh, you know, computers dressed up as everyday objects with, with interesting uh, enclosures and exotic peripherals. And many of these things have life and safety criticality implications and making sure that we could trust them is a very important job that's getting harder and harder as the days go by. Uh, so unlike software, which is ethereal and can be analyzed non-destructively, reverse engineered as many and you know, ran in, run in emulation as many times as necessary, uh, hardware is slightly different and generally testing it is a destructive process. It's also fraught with, with difficulties uh, and traditionally, uh, we've measured its trustworthiness by proxy, by looking at who makes it, uh, where do they make it, who works there. And, and that's getting harder and harder because wherever you are in the world, probably some of your hardware is being made in a country that's sort of frenemies with your own government. Uh, there's lots of multinational corporations scattered throughout the world. They have lots of NDAs and lots of lawyers trying to actually keep people from understanding what's going on behind the scenes. And then the workforce they hire is highly mobile and international and uh, nobody really, I mean, you could do security clearances and you could kind of constantly try to keep keep things under control, but, but that's kind of a difficult process. Um, and so, Let's kind of look over the hardware attack surface real quick. Uh, at the very bottom, there's manufacturing and, and foundries that may be malicious. Uh, insert a very small number of components to, uh, to perpetrate full, full uh, privilege escalation attacks, even if the software were theoretically uh, uh, perfect. And in fact, if a few years ago, even uh, at this uh, at this IEEE security and, and privacy workshop, there was the U University of Michigan A2 Trojan. And if I remember correctly, they had a, a demo where they inserted about 20 components, 20 transistors in a CPU die of billions. And that allowed a carefully orchestrated sequence of, of unprivileged instructions to essentially flip the privilege bit. So basically no software assistance, no reliance on any software bugs. An attacker who had something to do with manufacturing your CPU could basically gain root on your computer without any help from, from compromising the software. Now, shaving off layers and looking at die shots under the microscope may or may not catch 20 out of several billion components. But there's other different uh, attacks where the transistors are all where they're supposed to be and their doping polarity has maybe been reversed. And so they check out when you look at them in the picture, but they don't work the way you expect they would. So generally speaking, if, if we can't trust the, the chip foundry, then, then uh, we have a big problem. Now, assuming we can either mitigate against that problem or sort of pretend it's not there and move on, other problems that we, we may encounter are Malicious tool chains where perfect source code goes in and buggy uh, masks come out on the other end. And even if you trust the, the fab at that point, they're manufacturing the, the masks that already have the compromise built in. And then last but not least, uh, bugs in the source code. Uh, 
just like with software, could later turn out to be exploitable uh, security vulnerabilities. And some of them are innocent mistakes uh, inserted by enthusiastic engineers trying to make optimizations. Some of them are malicious. Uh, some of them have plausible deniability, but it's kind of hard to tell after the fact. Um, the idea is that, again, something that has been said earlier in this workshop today, the best way to, to avoid being touched by an attacker is to sort of close yourself off. So uh, my segue is into, into this concept of a self-hosting environment. And for those of you who like analogies, this is kind of like the ancient sort of uh, Greek myth of the ship of Theseus, where they were sailing this, this ship on the Mediterranean and had all the tools and the materials and the know-how on board to rebuild the ship while it was sailing without any uh, assistance from land or having to dock in any port. And so software, uh, if you think about maybe the BSD environment or the Linux environment, is such a self-hosting system. You have a kernel uh, that supports applications with, uh, you know, on top of a layer of system libraries like uh, maybe glibc. And then one of the most important applications that could run on top of the stack is the C compiler, which has the ability to build itself from its own sources. It has the ability to build the system libraries and the kernel. So this triplet kernel system libraries and C compiler can then build any extra applications that are necessary and further allow the development of the kernel and the, the libraries and, and itself. So it's a it's a closed system that doesn't depend on external sort of untrustworthy black box components that you can't analyze. Now, of course, the limitation of this is that it assumes the hardware running underneath is immutable and trustworthy, which if after today we still believe that, then we have a big problem. So then my project had set out to uh, extend the self-hosting environment to encompass as much of the underlying hardware as possible, all the way down to, to uh, the register transfer logic and the bitstream running on top of an FPGA. Uh, so looking at how hardware is developed, it is surprisingly similar to how software is developed. The language is slightly different and tends to be functional and declarative more than imperative, so more like a Lisp and Prolog, but the, the actual hardware languages that are most popular these days are Verilog and VHDL, and there's others on, uh, in addition to that, but these are the most, most famous ones. And so you write out in a, in a development environment a bunch of source code and then hit compile on your, on your development environment, and the software tool chain that compiles your source code will take the source and, and generate an, an, a successively more elaborate uh, graph of components all the way to logic gates, at which point we have the option of uh, elaborating this even further into actual transistors that make up the logic gates and represent that as a set of masks that then get fabricated, etched in silicon. Uh, now, this is sort of only a stage in the compilation pipeline in the same way that like a five megaton tail wags a tiny little chihuahua dog. This is several months uh, and, and millions of dollars worth of expense. And so, Oftentimes, FPGAs are used as uh, an alternative to that. So instead of generating masks of transistors, the gates are uh, laid out on top of a grid of identical configurable logic blocks that are controlled by a bunch of bits sitting in, in this memory called a bit stream. And so FPGAs have traditionally been used to uh, test and make sure that the hardware design actually works before committing to the hugely expensive uh, uh, endeavor of making uh, dedicated silicon out of it. But FPGAs also have very interesting properties from a security assurance point of view, uh, which we'll go over in a, in a second. So here's the comparison side by side. ASICs are optimized all the way down to transistors. They're subject to fabrication time attacks like the A2 Trojan, where a very small number of transistors are capable of, of flipping a privilege bit on a CPU. Uh, they're faster, they're smaller, 
uh, they're probably less power hungry than the equivalent design implemented in FPGAs. Now, FPGAs, grid of uh, components uh, of reconfigurable logic blocks, they're kind of like thinker toys, kind of like uh, snap circuits for grown up engineers. And there's a plane of memory bits called the bitstream that's not shown in this picture that uh, essentially tells each block what to do, how, what to be, and how to talk to, to its neighbors. And the idea is, uh, 20 transistors and the capacitor inserted here is a tiny needle in a huge haystack. In order to do something similar to a soft core CPU running on top of an FPGA, the attacker at fabrication time would have to put in a lot more needles throughout the haystack, which is qualitatively harder to conceal and less, less likely to be guaranteed to work. It's almost guaranteed not to work because uh, placement of functionality on an FPGA is a stochastic process and likely more likely than not, if you put something in there in, in the silicon, it's not even going to get used. And then if you put a lot of stuff in the silicon, it's going to get noticed. So if we use FPGAs, well, these aren't going to be high performance computing data center type of particle simulation uh, applications, but uh, soft core CPUs running on FPGAs will definitely be powerful enough to control things like weapon systems, uh, comms gear, uh, SCADA systems, things that actually do have life and safety and, uh, aspects to to uh, to their, uh, you know, they, they need to be trustworthy, but they don't need a lot of com computing power. Now, if we manage to sort of not worry about fabrication foundry time attacks against silicon, the rest of it is trusting the source code to the system that we're running and the build tool, not to be malicious. So. If we have a FPGA-based computer running hardware and software in the field, the level of trust we can place in the system is starting to be measured by looking at its hardware and software sources, but that's not a sufficient thing. We need to worry about the build tool being malicious, so we have to recurse into analyzing it, its sources. And of course, those sources have to be compiled, so it's a turtles all the way down kind of recursion that terminates with the uh, Ken Thompson trusting the trust question of whether our C compiler itself has been has been subverted and is acting maliciously. Now, I have a, an extra slide so we could deal with this in the Q and A, but there's a uh, process. Uh, proposed by uh, David A. Wheeler in his PhD dissertation called Diverse Double Compilation, where two C compilers that are unlikely to be in collusion with each other are pitted against each other and they rebuild each other's sources all the way to where you can use a bit-by-bit -bit comparison to ascertain that your C compiler of interest is likely to not have been compromised. And once we could trust the C compiler, we could basically rebuild the entire world and declare that the level of trust we may place in the fielded system is equivalent to the level of trust we could put in the entire bundle of cumulative source code that we do have or do need to have in order to make that assessment. So now, instead of it being a supply chain problem, it's a problem of looking through all these sources with tools, with methods, formal methods, what have you, to measure just how much we can trust source code we should be able to see, and then we know how much we can trust the system in the field. And uh, how do we bootstrap this? Uh, it's actually what uh, I believe the DOD means when they say clean room. There's a lot of talk about clean room environments in various DOD conferences that I've attended. And I don't believe they, they, they should be talking about, or they are talking about like a, an actual physical room with guards at the door and, and a bunch of off-the-shelf computers being ordered and installed inside with off-the-shelf software and then you know controlling who gets in and out. But rather, we start with a host system, for instance, something running x86 Linux, and we're trying to build a clean room target according to a rigorous process, maybe a RISC-V 64-bit uh, system running Linux as well. And so what we do, we start by using diverse double compilation to uh, make sure that our C compiler on the host system and the C cross compiler running on the host system building binaries for the target environment are clean. And then we could build both uh, 
the hardware tool chain for both the host and the target environment. Uh, we could build the target environment's software by cross-compiling sources like kernel libraries, utilities, C compiler, uh, the HDL tool chain, what have you. And then finally, using the native version of the HDL compiler on the host system, we're going to build Bitstream for the FPGA that's going to support the target environment. And when we have all these components, we put them together, we boot up the clean room environment, which from this point on is capable of self-hosting. It could rebuild its own Bitstream, it could rebuild its own kernel, system libraries, C compiler, and any other application. And we can trust it to honestly compile any other sources we import into it from this point forward. Uh, for the list of ingredients to the system, I used uh, Lattice's ECP5 chips because uh, there's an open source tool chain available on GitHub that can build Bitstream for them without needing black box uh, uh, non-transparent uh, vendor tools. Now, for anyone who may think this is sort of an open source uh, free software propaganda piece, it is not. The main idea is that the end owner of the system should be given the full set of sources needed to field strip, in essence, to rebuild uh, the hardware and software of the system they're running on anytime they feel they need to reass reassess or reacquire trust in the system. So for me to do a proof of concept, I needed, I had to use open source projects because nobody's going to give me proprietary access to tools like, uh, you know, vendor compilers and things like that. So I have Yosis, Trellis, and NextP and R, which are the compiler and the place and route tool and the bitstream generation utilities for ECP5 that are fully uh, free and open source software. And I used RISC-V and the Rocket chip, which is uh, respectively Berkeley's specification for fully open instruction set architecture. And the Rocket chip is basically the reference implementation, the reference design for that specification on GitHub. And because I needed a chipset with a memory controller and the system bus and a bunch of peripherals to deal with network and micro SD card and the terminal, I have uh, another open source project called LightX, which is a system on chip sort of virtual motherboard type thing. Finally, uh, there's a port to 64-bit RISC-V of the Fedora uh, Linux operating system. And the goal is to run that and basically run the tool chain on the machine on the system itself. Uh, here's the block diagram of the actual computer I built. The dark blue uh, pieces are all basically expressed as FP, uh, FPGA bitstream. And you can see how the rocket chip talks to LightX, the memory controller, the bus, uh, and the various peripherals. And then there's uh, on the develop on the FPGA development board, there's memory and the connection to, uh, to a terminal and the network connection and the way to insert a micro SD card. Um, the system is really, really slow. So it's about as one third as fast and powerful as the original Pentium from the mid nineties. Uh, and that is because uh, the, the lattice chip is a relatively uh, low end FPGA. There's work in progress as we speak to make Xilinx's more powerful FPGAs uh, targetable by free open source uh, tool chains. So this should get better really soon and there's also a lot of inefficiencies in the way rocket and litex interact because uh, i had to put this together within the time frame of the grant i had and i had to have something that works first before there is there's anything we can do to optimize it so there's a lot of room for for improvement and optimization in the way the actual uh cpu and the chipset interact with each other and the way they drive the memory controller and the access to peripherals and so on so this should should be possible to make a lot better uh, with relatively low effort and that's the near term in the mid in the mid mid range uh, time frame i'm i'm excited to have a completely bounded set of source code that uh, fully expresses the trust trustability of the system that that uh, it builds that is built from it and so we could throw formal methods and analyze that bundle of source code uh, to put a number on just how trustworthy this computer is. And I am hoping in the long run, uh, uh, 
end customers will work it into their, their acquisition policies to insist on the ability to essentially field strip their, their uh, uh, computer-based uh, systems that, that are critical for, for safety and, uh, and security. So uh, in conclusion, we're talking about not using supply chain as a proxy for uh, measuring hardware assurance, but doing so directly by looking at source code. We're using FPGAs to work around the problem of uh, being unable to fully trust fabrication facilities, chip foundries, and this concept of field stripping, of rebuilding something from complete sources in order to reacquire uh, a level of trust in, in its uh, level of, of uh, trust trustability. Um, so this is, I mean, and so basically the bundle of source code is much better than any sort of barcode or sticker that somebody could put on, on a thing declaring it safe. The best way to do it is yourself. Should, should you ever have a question of whether something is trustworthy, you should actually be able to go back and build it from first principles. And then, and then, you know, just like, you know, in a combat situation, you should be able to take apart and put back together your, your rifle as a, as a combatant. Uh, this pro project, by the way, is fully reproducible. Uh, you should be able to go to this uh, URL and follow the instructions and build your own uh, fully trustworthy, well, at least as much as the source code you're putting into it, a uh, computer system that can run Linux. And there is actually at this website, there's a video of, of it being able to run uh, Yosis and NextPNR for place and route as well. And uh, with this demo, I am now turning it all back to Michael, who, who's going to fill the Q&A. And I want to thank you all for uh, being here and sharing this with me. Thank you, Gabriel. I uh, appreciate the presentation. The questions are starting to come in, so we have a few minutes to be able to answer. Um, let's start with a question from Mark Novak. Uh, can the same level of assurance be achieved by building two fast systems out of uh, out of performance but entirely different components and comparing binary outputs? Uh, so uh, I've 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 heard of this concept of basically having two systems, but uh, really what you want is three systems and having them vote essentially on on the output. Uh, it gets really expensive if you try to do that, though, because now you have to have redundancy, right? I mean, with two systems, the problem comes to what do you do when they disagree with each other? Which one do you trust more? Which is why typically uh, redundant, you know. Having having three things that 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 do the same thing, and then and then if two of them agree, then then they outvote the one that that disagrees, is what I've typically seen uh, proposed. But yeah, I mean that works, but the, the problem is one of cost. Essentially, you're going to have three times the the silicon or the or the computer for for the price of one, or for the value of one. Okay, a couple of other uh, related questions. Um, do you still need to trust your memory vendor or how are other components authenticated uh, hardware and software that, that you use in your system? So uh, the being able to trust the actual RAM itself is out of scope for this project. I had pretty much enough on my plate trying to come up with, with the actual computer itself. Uh, the RAM, although is is maybe a lot simpler to look at with like x-rays and microscopes than than an actual ASIC CPU, which has a lot of uh, visual randomness in it. Memories, just like FPGAs, are regular grids. And so I would be less worried about missing something if I, if I looked at one under the microscope or even just with x-rays in a non-destructive way. So uh, of course, there's other chips that, that are, are sort of in the pipeline and there's other works like I, I think Bonnie Wong has uh, a system called Be Trusted, which uh, they, they have a whole thing about how the motherboard of this thing is only one layer and you can make sure there's no secret things inserted in the middle and it's put in some kind of uh, transparent case so you can see there's no actual extra silicon writing uh, on, on the bus of the, of the system besides the FPGA and so on. But uh, 
I figured carving out this this part where I have the CPU and the system on the chip talking to external network uh, memory and, and, and SD card is, is probably a good first step. This could be made better, obviously, in the future. Other related, um, if you had unlimited time and funding, what would your other um, um, efforts to tackle this clean room and uh, field uh, trustworthiness, uh, where would that lead you? Well, hopefully uh, it would lead me to a world in which uh, if I don't know computers, like if I'm not a professional computer scientist, I have somebody within shouting the distance who could help me uh, re reacquire trust in any kind of piece of equipment that my life depends on. Right, I wouldn't have to. I wouldn't have to hang off of a of a vendor that's like uh, different in a different country or or like a mailing sort of phone call away. I could have a buddy uh, within within yelling range that could help me make sure that I can trust this thing. So that's kind of the utopia that I that I would like to live in. I'm sure it's a long way away, but this is a very small step in that direction. Great. A couple other questions as they're coming in. Um, <clears throat> let me ask a, a, a bit of a naive question because I don't know enough about um, how FPGAs operate, but I understand they differ from ASICs because they are field programmable, right? So there is uh, some level of hardware uh, redesign that could take place, uh, which is which is a feature of your system. Um, would, would the kind of attack, not necessarily the same attack, but the kind of attack that comes from uh, smashing stacks and, and return-oriented programming, Things that use um, use the tools that you've provided without actually importing any new malware or new software. But if I could somehow maliciously control the reprogramming of your device, is there a defense a defense against that? A, so, a self detector. Okay, so, so so one thing one thing about FPGAs, they don't necessarily, very rarely do they, or at least in this particular scenario that I'm that I'm envisioning, they're not reprogrammed constantly they're programmed when they power on when you want to turn it into a system on chip or a cpu mm -hmm. you put a bunch of bitstream in its uh special uh, memory and then that bitstream at each bit tells one small part of the fpga what to do and it stays that way while this thing is being a cpu for as long as it's powered on so uh there's no runtime attack against it the 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 thing you can worry about is, okay, so it's a regular grid of logic blocks that get told what to do, and then sort of the, the CPU is sort of an emergent property of this. Uh, if, if an attacker at fabrication time wants to attack it, they would have to strategically place lots of needles in, in this haystack on the off chance that one of them might turn out to be useful. Uh, they could maybe, or, or so, sort of the attacker could intercept the bitstream while it's being programmed into the FPGA. That's a one-time boot time attack, like when you power it on. Uh, that is essentially out of scope for this project, but but uh, it's the same kind of mitigation that you do for, for computer firmware these days, making sure that whatever takes your bitstream and pipes it into your FPGA doesn't alter uh, that bitstream. So that's a little bit outside of the FPGA itself. It's basically the microcontroller on the dev board that takes the bitstream and pumps it in. I don't know, have I have I actually gotten anywhere, anywhere close to answering the question or, or do, you, I, do you want I to follow up? My, um, one of the things I'm curious about, I, you know, I, as I've learned more about these, these hardware-based attacks, particularly in, in um, uh, human safety systems and cyber physical systems, the, uh, the Triton Trisys malware uh, that modified um, Triton uh, SIS, the safety system, uh, can be defeated in a number of different ways. But one of the things that I learned is that it can be defeated by turning the key, a physical key, into a, a run mode versus reprogrammable mode. And a lot of these devices are left in a reprogrammable mode because it's easier for field engineers to connect remotely and to do things dynamically and to, you know, everybody updates code in production, even though we know we're not supposed to do that. Um, right. But if you physically lock the hardware into its run mode, uh, and we're talking about essentially a, a PLC, a, a much simpler device, um, it, it, all these attacks go away, right? It's it's no longer reprogrammable. So, so what I don't understand is, is the FPGA still reprogrammable while it's running or only when it's loading? So generally speaking, the FPGA 
is reprogrammable when you hit the reset button and some microcontroller that's on the board basically will pump a bunch of bits into the FPGA's memory that, that is there for telling the configurable, configurable block what to do. Now, if, if for some reason you can have a, an FPGA manufacturer that has this memory be like a, 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 you know, have a toggle where it can't be reprogrammed when the toggle is, is flipped or maybe have it be a write once thing that's basically written in forever. And I'm sure there's FPGAs that to do that where you can get to program them only once. And then you have to do the bootstrapping field stripping exercise at the time you program it, but then then it's no longer programmable. I can I can envision that happening if you're if you're extra paranoid. It, it is a little out of scope for what I did here, but that's kind of uh, just sort of you know play you know hypothesizing. It's possible to do that. Yes. Perfect. Great. Okay. So uh, uh, one more um, good question I see here. Uh, from your experience, how accurate are the academic experiments regarding hardware trojans that are done on FPGAs versus commodity PC hardware? Uh, well, I'm 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 a little I'm a little confused about the the, the question itself. Are we are we talking about uh, doing CPUs in FPGA and then and then trying to attack them that way versus attacking real CPUs or uh, are we talking about the, the the academic making vulnerable chips like with the A2 Trojan? I, I, I don't know exactly. I would have to speculate. I think the question is, is related to using FPGAs in a way to mimic other hardware and then attacking them uh, as representative of uh, field hardware that's out there. For instance, if an academic has budget for um, an academic researcher has budget for an FPGA or a few, but not a wide variety of um, proprietary um, uh, fielded ASIC hardware, are are the experiments that we do on the FPGA accurate accurately representing what's what's out in the field? So it all depends, right? If the, if the vulnerabilities are in silicon then no, because the FPGA emulates the behavior of the hardware at the higher layer. So basically it's, 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 it's essentially anything that's at the register transfer logic and above would probably be a fair game for, for uh, using FPGAs in lieu of, of real hardware. Anything below the register transfer logic that actually involves silicon and uh, you know, things physically in, in, the, in the chip itself obviously that won't be that won't work and any any attempt to do something like that would be unfair okay okay in my opinion again i mean this i'm, I'm i I'm, i don't feel i'm super authoritative on on that exact question but that's kind of my my personal opinion about it and that's that's why we have you here thank you so much gabriel for your uh, for your presentation